Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Asia Pacific Centre for Social Investment and Philanthropy at Swinburne University of Technology, may I welcome you all to an evening conversation at Swinburne with Professor Peter Singer on the subject, should charity really begin at home? Let us begin by recognising the custodians of the land on which we meet for whom this is indeed home. We respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We also pay respects to all Aboriginal community elders, past and present. The focus of our evening conversation is giving. Giving more, giving ethically, giving effectively, and figuring how to do all three at once. And that's not a simple matter. Swinburne University itself is the beneficiary of many generous donors over the years. And as beneficiaries of their generosity, those of us who work at the university are determined to ensure that their giving is demonstrably effective. Among the university's many generous donors, uh, the Meyer and Pratt Foundations supported the creation of our Asia Pacific Centre for Social Investment and Philanthropy over 10 years ago. And since then, the founding director of the centre, Dr Michael Liffman, and his team of teachers and researchers have worked to ensure that those early gifts keep on giving. The Asia Pacific Centre itself gives back in part by convening important public forums throughout the year, such as this one, in which we are all invited to come together at no cost and enjoy the benefits to this day of that early benefaction. And to bring questions of ethical and effective giving to wider public attention and to critical scrutiny and, where possible, to action. We give by focusing our research and engagement around three core themes in the centre of diversity, transparency and leadership. And we give through our teaching and the Graduate Certificate in Social Impact in the Masters in Social Investment and Philanthropy and PhD programs of study through practice and through research. And we keep on giving by effectively embedding ourselves within the institution, Swinburne, that now supports us, for which we acknowledge the generous assistance of Vice-Chancellor Linda Christensen and Dean Michael Gilding and their executive teams. The Asia Pacific Centre of social investment and philanthropy is an important part of the university and it's here to serve, particularly to serve people in need. Again, as I said, not least, by convening meetings of this kind of which we can all discuss how to give more, more ethically and more effectively. And it's in this spirit that we're honoured to welcome the Vice-Chancellor and our guest speaker, Professor Peter Singer, AO, and our distinguished discussants, Professor Joe Barraquette, Sandy DeWolf, AM, and Julian Burnside, AOQC, each of whom we shall introduce in a moment. It's now my privilege to introduce you to Professor Linda Christensen, who's been the Vice-Chancellor of Swinburne University of Technology since 2011. Linda will introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much, John. Let me begin by offering a very warm, warm welcome, especially on a chilly night, to Professor Peter Singer, our panel members, Julian Burnside, AO, Sandy DeWolf, AM, and Professor Joe Paracat. Welcome as well to alumni, colleagues, staff, and friends of Swinburne. It's terrific to have you here tonight. And it's a privilege to be able to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Peter Singer. Professor Singer is Professor of Bioethics at Princeton University and Laureate Professor at the University of Melbourne. Professor Singer specialises in applied ethics and considers ethical issues from a secular, utilitarian perspective. He is also the founder of the organisation The Life You Can Save, named after his book of the same title. 
Professor Singer is an advocate of effective altruism, which holds that leading an ethical life involves using a portion of our personal wealth and resources to efficiently alleviate the effects of extreme poverty. Tonight, Professor Singer's topic is the ethics of giving should charity really begin at home. He will argue that we should use the resources we have to bring about the most good. And poverty in poor countries is a very different proposition to poverty in Australia. This difference means that we can reduce suffering more and save more lives by helping people in extreme poverty beyond our borders. Following his speech, Professor Singer will be joined by a distinguished panel, Julian Burnside, Sandy DeWolf, and Professor Jill Barakat, who's the Director of Centre for Social Impact here at Swinburne. The panel will engage with Professor Singer's concepts and lead what I know will be a very lively discussion. I know you will enjoy this evening, so please join me in welcoming Professor Peter Singer. My Chancellor, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Thank you for that welcome from all of you in the audience, and thank you for all of those who've been involved in organizing this event and then making sure that we have a large and full lecture theater despite the cold and rainy night outside. It's good to see you here. So as you've just heard, um, I will indeed be arguing that charity should not begin at home, but let me just say one thing about a possible sense of that saying, which I don't object to. Um, some people, when they hear that, they think, well, what that means is that you need to learn from what your home is like. In other words, you need, as a child, you need to see your parents practicing charity. And in that sense, charity begins at home because it helps to form the child to become a more charitable being. I have no objection to that thesis at all. If that's the way you interpret charity begins at home, that's fine. Um, what I am going to object to is the idea that charity should have a particular focus on home and not just home in the very narrow sense of exactly the, the, the household in which I live, the family, but rather home in the sense of the local community and as you'll see, I'll be talking about uh, some other possible ways in which people often are charitable that I don't think are the best ways to be charitable. So, having put, the, put that possible interpretation of what I'm talking about on one side, let me have a look at what I do want to say. And uh, the first point I want to argue is simply this, that some causes are better than others. Now, you might think that's so obvious, why do I need to bother even arguing for it? But as the subheading to this slide suggests, some people don't believe that. Some people think that the choice of your charitable or philanthropic cause is really subjective. There's just no right or wrong answer. And one of the bodies that thinks that is Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors, who are one of the big players in the field of philanthropy advice, particularly in the United States, but elsewhere in the world as well, responsible for advising billions of dollars in charitable donations. You can go online and take a look at their website and see what it says about making choices in philanthropy. And one of the things you find is this thing that talks about your philanthropy roadmap. How are you going to decide where to direct, where to guide your philanthropy? Um, and that has a number of brochures, online brochures, um, which you can read in more detail. And this is the one that I'm going to focus on. It's called Finding Your Focus in Philanthropy. And that's where you can find the position that I mentioned stated. But first, what you get is a picture of the field of philanthropy, how it pictures it. And this is interesting in itself. You have a look at these categories and you might ask yourself, well, where are we talking about global poverty here? Isn't global poverty and trying to do something about it an important category of philanthropy at least, even if it's not the only one? 
But where does it belong here? Well, I guess you could say there's, um, whoops, where is it? There's economic security up there. But of course, that doesn't distinguish between economic security for impoverished Americans, which of course there are quite a few, um, and economic security for the world's poorest people, those below the World Bank's extreme poverty line. Um, there's education, again, exactly the same thing can be said. There's health and safety. They can all have human and civil rights environment. They can all have an aspect of global poverty, um, but it's certainly not, it's not emphasized in any way in presenting this. And um, just to mention another interest of mine that happens to be absent, where does animal welfare come into this picture? That's really hard to find anywhere. In fact, I think you could say it's excluded because it's not all environmental, obviously. Um, so uh, it's a, it seems to me a strange way of picturing the field. But that's not really my main interest here. It's this quote that I'm particularly interested in putting up there um, as saying, well, there's obviously, obviously, it's not just, not just the case, there's obviously no objective answer to that question of what's the most urgent issue. And that, I think, leads to the view that when somebody is interested in being philanthropic or charitable, they should just follow their own inclinations and their own passions in terms of what they do. So if they're interested in the arts, they should give to the arts. If um, a member of the family died from breast cancer, they should give to breast cancer research. Um, if they care about wilderness, they should give to protecting national parks or something like that. And if they care about global poverty, they should give to organizations that are doing something about global poverty, but there's nothing more that you can say. It's just follow your passion. Well, there's certainly something to be said for people following their passions in some areas, but I don't think it is just a matter of following your passion. I think there is a lot more to be said, and even if objective answers are sometimes hard to come by, there are things that you can say about different cases that some choices are better than others. And here's an example. Um, some of you may recognize this painting, some of you may not. It's a painting by the uh, uh, late medieval Italian painter Duccio. Uh, it's known as the Stroganoff Madonna because it was held by the uh, Stroganoff family for many years. And the reason I'm putting it up here is it was uh, a few years ago bought by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York for a price of $45 million. So um, the Met, to, to buy the painting, when it knew it was coming up for auction, the Met approached a number of donors. It didn't want to pay it just out of its regular income. It approached a number of donors and said, will you be prepared to donate if we're successful in buying this auction and how much? A, a small number of, of large donors. And through them, it got enough to pay $45 million. So, I'm not looking at whether the Met was right to use its funds to buy this work of art. The Met exists in order to buy works of art and, and house them and exhibit them and so on. So, yeah, you could say they, they, that's their brief. That's what they should do. But I'm looking at it from the point of view of the donors. If you were one of the donors whom the Met came to and said, we ha may have the opportunity to buy this painting. We're expecting it'll go for somewhere in the 40 to $50 million region. Would you be prepared to put in whatever it might be, let's say $5 million, uh, if you're that kind of donor who can put in that sort of money, to buy this. Would it be the case that that would be a good thing to do with your money and that there would be no objective way of deciding whether there would be a better thing to do with your money? Well, obviously, some donors did put in that money because the work was bought for the Met um, for that price. And there it is where, to some extent, no doubt, it enhances the experience of visitors to the Met. How much does it enhance them? Well, I'm not sure. As you can see, it's a fairly small painting. And as it's a very expensive painting, it's not, the Met is not going to let you get right up close to it. It's not going to let you see it without a barrier of, I don't know what this is, bulletproof glass or something like that between you and it. Um, but you do, you do get to see it, along, of course, with, if you've been to the Met, a very large number of other paintings, so many other paintings, so many other very fine paintings, I would say, that, you know, it becomes difficult to recall after you've been there a couple of hours which of the, 
great paintings you've seen, but never mind, let's admit that it does enhance your experience to some extent. You still can't answer the question whether that was a good use of money um, because you need to ask what else you could have done with that money. Let me just say one other thing. You probably also need to ask what else would have happened to the painting if the Met hadn't bought it. And if the answer was some maniac was going to make a bonfire with it, then that's one question, um, whether it's worth preserving the painting for $45 million. But obviously that's an extremely unlikely scenario. The underbidder was probably another gallery or museum, or possibly a very expensive private collector who would have valued and preserved the painting. So I don't think it would have been lost as part of our cultural heritage. What else, though, can you do with the money? That's the important question. Well, here's an example. This is a clinic that's been set up in a developing country in, uh, in Africa. Um, I think this is in North Africa, in fact, to treat trachoma which is the largest cause of preventable blindness. Trachoma is caused by an organism that gets in people's eyes in certain uh, conditions, generally not in developed countries, but in developing countries, um, gets in their eyes perhaps when they're quite young, and if untreated, uh, gradually their vision blurs over about 15 years, and at the end of that period, they're likely to become blind for the rest of their lives if there's no further treatment. The cost of tra treating trachoma has been variously estimated by a range of different studies, uh, something like from 25 to $100 per case of blindness prevented. So if you assume that those figures are roughly accurate, um, or if you Take, let's say, just to make the math very simple, let's say take $45, which is you know, sort of somewhere in the middle of that range roughly, then it's easy to see that you could prevent a million people becoming blind for $45 million. Maybe it's $90 and you could only prevent half a million people becoming blind. I'm not committed to any figure, but as I say, estimates are somewhere in that range. Now. Is it obvious that there's no objective answer to the question, is it better for that painting to be exhibited in the Met rather than somewhere else, or perhaps to go to a private collector, than for half a million or a million people to continue to have good vision, whereas otherwise they would be slowly going blind and then be blind for the rest of their lives, living in conditions where there isn't much in the way of um, assistance for people who are blind. Um, it's bad enough to be blind in any society, I think, um, but obviously it's a bit better if you can get various kinds of assistance. Um, and if you can't, and uh, uh, because you're blind you can't earn a living, um, it makes a even bigger negative impact on your life. I think it is pretty obvious that um, it's better to prevent that number of people becoming blind than to somewhat enhance the experience of visitors to the Met by seeing that painting uh, rather than, let's say, only a private collector. That's sort of, I, I would say, the worst scenario if the Met hadn't bought it. So I think that those donors who said, yes, I am prepared to put up money so the Met can buy the Duccio were making a mistake. I don't think it's just a matter of you know, they had this passion and other people have this passion. I think they were not doing the best thing that they could have done with the money that they donated. Okay, so let's, perhaps some of you at this stage are saying something like this. Um, I agree with you that art is not the best, the best use of our money, given the way the world is and given the number of extremely poor people in the world and the things we could do with money to help them. But there's also poverty in Australia, isn't there? And this is where we come back to the idea of uh, charity begins at home. Shouldn't, we're Australians, shouldn't we be focusing on poverty in Australia? We have enough people here who are poor rather than talk about poverty elsewhere. Well, I think to think about that, you need to think about the difference of what it, we're talking about when we talk about poverty in Australia as when we talk about poverty in developing countries in the world. Um, 
for two reasons. One about what it means to a person's life and the other about the cost of making change. So here's a figure um, that the poverty line in Australia, if we talk about statistics about the number of poor people in Australia, we're usually talking in terms of these uh, what are known as Henderson poverty lines after the person who, who drew them up originally, um, which get adjusted for inflation, of course. Um, and so the figure I have is um, $71.85 per day, less than that and you're in poverty. And we can compare that with the World Bank's extreme poverty line. Uh, the World Bank tells us that more than a billion people in the world are living on less than $1.25 per day. And that is not a currency exchange figure. If you spend time in developing countries, you'll say, oh, things are very cheap there. Yeah, you know, you, could, you, could, you can get a meal for 30 cents, um, Australian converted in, in some of these countries. So you wouldn't really need that much to live on. This figure is a purchasing power adjusted figure. So it's taking into account the difference in what money buys and it's the amount in the currency in the developing country that buys in that country the same as $1.25 buys in the US. So it's really very little. I should say to be completely fair, it's uh, that $1.25 is, is an old figure, it's a sort of fixed dollar figure and to, it ought to be adjusted for inflation. It may not by now be about $1.75 um, in current US dollar terms. Um, let's say $2 Australian. Um, but obviously it's way less than uh, the poverty line in Australia. So that means that uh, whereas people who are poor in Australia have things like safe drinking water, education for their children, basic health care, sufficient income to buy enough food to avoid undernutrition and malnutrition, um, many people in other countries, in fact a lot of these people who are below the World Bank's poverty line, do not have these, do not have enough income to provide these uh, in a reliable way for themselves or for their children if, they're, um, if they have dependents. And as a result of that is that uh, according to UNICEF's figures there are more than six million children under five who die each year from preventable poverty related diseases of the kind that are mentioned here and these deaths can be prevented relatively cheaply. Again there's a lot of debate about what the figures are um, there's a UN figure uh, of around $300 for preventing deaths by immunizing against uh, measles and some other diseases like that. Uh, Give Well, a charity evaluator I'm going to mention in a moment, says $2,000. That's a pretty conservative figure. But obviously, it's far less than we're prepared to spend in our healthcare system, and we do spend in our healthcare system to save lives, where it's not uncommon to be spending a million dollars, let's say, on neonatal intensive care for an extremely premature baby in order to save its life or at the other end of life or, or at you know, old age as well. So there are huge disparities in that sense. And um, organisations that specifically set out to say where do you get the biggest bang for your buck tend to agree with this. So here's one I mentioned, GiveWell, um, set up in 2007 specifically to evaluate charities and work out where you're going to get the best value for what you do. The most rigorous charity evaluator, a lot of people think too rigorous, too strict in the, its demands for evidence and demonstrable standards, uh, recommending only a small percentage of the charities that it evaluates. Which doesn't mean, by the way, that it thinks that all of the other ones on this pie chart, all of the ones sort of from there around to there, are not doing good work. It's simply saying they haven't been able to provide us with the evidence to assure us that they are doing good work. As you know, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Um, so uh, they may be doing good work but simply haven't really been able to demonstrate it to GiveWell's satisfaction. But GiveWell started out by looking at American charities, charities that work in the United States on education, helping the poor, uh, health improvement for the poor in America, as well as looking at charities that work overseas. And after a year or two of that, it just said, look, it's just obvious that the best value for your money is going to be charities helping 
the global poor as compared to charities helping the poor in the United States. So we're not even going to look at charities in the United States anymore. Um, it's enough work to do to look at, to try to find the best of the ones helping um, in developing countries. Uh, and I think, you know, that's, that's a sensible judgment for them. Similarly, an organisation called Giving What We Can, set up in England, uh, looks at finding the best charities. It too is focused on uh, charities that are working in developing countries. And if you want to say, well, what's the ethical basis for what I'm talking about? Um, this is a late 19th century utilitarian philosopher called Henry Sidgwick, not nearly as well known as Bentham or John Stuart Mill. Um, I think a better philosopher, and I'm biased because I've just, uh, my most recent book is called The Point of View of the Universe, which is um, a phrase from uh, uh, Sidgwick, as you can see here, um, looking at uh, his defense of a utilitarian ethic. Um, but I think this is, obviously it's a, a lot more to be said, but I think this is the sort of fund fundamental ethical basis for this claim, that um, if we're to think ethically, we ought to take this larger point of view and we ought to acknowledge that my well-being is of no greater intrinsic significance than your well-being or yours, but that's also of no greater intrinsic significance than the well-being of a person in Malawi or Bangladesh or wherever else in the world they might be. And that's why we should be looking at where we can make the biggest difference. And when we look at that, then we have to take into effect not only how badly off people are, but the cost of making that difference. And as you can see from those figures I quoted before, if someone is on $500 a week, $25,000 a year, if you give them $1,000, you're not really going to radically transform their lives. You're giving them something that's incremental, that's no doubt useful to them, but it's not going to make a huge difference. If someone is on, let's say, $700 a year, as hundreds of millions of people in the world are on $700 a year or less, um, then if you give them $1,000, you've more than doubled their income from that year. They can do things with that money that make a big difference to their lives. Or if you don't give them the money, you can use it to provide basic healthcare services, services which can save their lives, or as I've already said, save their sight perhaps. So the difference you can make with the same amount of resources is a big multiple if you put it overseas. Okay, so this is um, what effective altruism, the movement, is saying. Um, so I'll just whip through this fairly quickly because we've got an interesting panel to come into this and I don't want to take up too much time. But um, it's a, an emerging movement which is applying evidence and reason to working out the most effective ways to improve the world and fairly recently got a Wikipedia page, so you can look more, more about it there. Uh, one of the organisations in it, as the Vice-Chancellor uh, mentioned in introducing me, is The Life You Can Save, um, which tries to educate people about uh, effective altruism and about what you can do for global poverty. And um, this, there is a Melbourne chapter of The Life You Can Save. Uh, if you want to contact them, you actually have two ways of doing it. Um, there's uh, an email address, you can write down an email, but there are some members of that organisation here, and when the event is all over, um, they're going to come down the front, and if you want to talk to them, they'll be wearing little badges talking about the life you can save and what you can do. So, um, this is really uh, my, my argument, that um, we ought to be thinking about doing good in the world, that I'm not saying necessarily that that's the only thing we ought to be thinking about. I think there's people in the effective altruism movement at all sorts of different levels of how much their commitment is. Um, from some people who are essentially living on basically a kind of minimal income and donating everything beyond that to the most effective charities they can find. And other people who are pledging to give modest amounts um, on the, uh, the website here, you can find a, a scale that I suggest, the same as I do in the book, which is a progressive scale, like the income tax scale, that starts off at a very low amount for people who are not earning 
a large amount and uh, increases for people who are earning more. So you could meet that scale and then I think you would be doing something significant and making a contribution. Or you can be anywhere in between. But the idea of the movement is that if you uh, want to think ethically and want to live your life ethically, um, you can't, it's not enough just to say, well, there are certain moral rules, the thou shalt not sort of rules that I'm going to observe, like I'm not going to cheat, kill, steal, maim, uh, and so on. But that given the way the world is, given how fortunate we all are, to be in a society like Australia that can provide basic services to everyone and for most of us anyway, middle class and above, provide us with a standard of living where we have more than we need, we have things that we can easily spare, we have money to spend on uh, things that are not really at all essential to our lives, then to live an ethical life is also to um, contribute in some way to making the world a better place and as I've said I think the most effective way to do that is to think about charity in the developing world in particular where it can make such a big difference. Thank you very much. On behalf of all present I'd like to thank you Professor Singer for that stimulating presentation. Those of us who teach and work in the business of philanthropy and social investment, and I can see many of us here this evening, or those who might be interested in doing so, <clears throat> uh, generally ask the question, how can I be effective in what I do? Or how can I learn to be effective? Um, what Professor Singer is asking us to do is pose a prior question. Just as, not just how can I be effective in what I propose to do, but is what I propose to do worth doing? adding to the question of efficiency and effect, the question of value or ethics. And I think we all understand this is a critically important issue, highlighting in a sense the, the decisions that precede giving about what's really worth doing in this world to make the world a better place. And for this, we appreciate Professor Singer's contribution, not only this evening, but throughout his recent uh, working career and publications. Now, um, we have with us, um, three speakers who will arise and respond and tell us a little of their own understanding of these issues. And after that, there'll be an opportunity for everyone present, or those of you who wish to do so within the time available, to ask questions. Now, our speakers, our discussants, will speak in, well, I'll introduce them in the reverse order to which they're speaking, so that Joe Barraquette will stand up immediately after the introduction. Um, our third discussant is Julian Burnside, a commercial barrister well known to many, I'm sure, here, who's practi who practices principally in commercial litigation, trade practice and administrative law. He's known for his strong public opposition to the mandatory detention of asylum seekers and has provided legal counsel in a wide variety of high profile cases. Some of us may not be aware <coughs> that Julian is also himself a philanthropist um, who has co contributed significantly to the community in Melbourne internationally in recent years. Sandy DeWolf um, is the Chief Executive Officer of Berry Street and has been so since 1994. Berry Street, I'm sure you're aware, is the largest independent child and family welfare organisation in Victoria, providing services across the state, employing over 750 staff and with an annual turnover of over 60 million, which it seeks to spend to good effect. Sandy's involved as well in a number of cross-sectoral government um, and other agencies at state and national level, including the Victorian Government's Children's Council, of which he's the Deputy Chair, the Commission for Children and Young People of the Department of Human Services Steering Committee for Task Force 1000, the Victorian Industry Skills Consultative Committee, Families and Children Working Group, the Ministerial Advisor, Advisory Council on Homelessness, and many others. Um, Sandy, of course, will be familiar to many of us here as well. Joe Barraquette is a new addition to this university, but is also very well known around Australia, particularly in the social enterprise area. She's a, a public activist and researcher 
in the field of social enterprise and social innovation. And she's joined Swinburne to direct our new Centre for Social Impact, Swinburne University. Um, Swinburne Centre for Social Impact incorporates the Asia Pacific Centre for Social Investment and Philanthropy. And we're delighted to work in Joe's centre and very closely with Joe in promoting issues of social investment, philanthropy, social enterprise, and social innovation. So may I invite Joe to say a few words? <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, in the spirit of not privileging, not privileging the home team, which I think is part of Professor Singer's thesis for tonight, I'm going to speak very briefly. Because I'm a sociologist and I can't introduce myself in under 15 minutes, I've written some pre-prepared <laughs> notes. But the problem of doing that when listening to a speaker who dispenses with your thesis in the first three minutes of their conversation <laughs> um, creates a bit of a, a, a challenge. I did want to just quickly revisit the issue of does charity really begin at home or should it? Um, obviously, this, uh, we have no argument here, Peter, um, but um, from a sociological perspective, I do think that we need to be cognizant of the role of the household, the home, the family, the neighbourhood, the community in modelling the cultural norms that we want to see and that we want to uh, produce and expand throughout um, our giving practice. But I guess in lieu of talking at some length on that particular topic, I wanted to make a couple of points. One is speaking to my own areas of expertise around social economy and social enterprise and social innovation is what are the ways in which we can give differently? So the conversation tonight is organised very much around the question of philanthropy and I have no objection to that. As an individual citizen I feel compelled by Professor Singer's thesis and I know that I'm going to go away tonight and I'm not just going to think about it, I'm going to do something tonight to give differently and to give more and to give et more ethically. But that said, I think that being part of a cosmopolitan citizenship and playing a function as a cosmopolitan citizen, I should say, is thinking through our practices more broadly and particularly our significant economic practices with regard to purchasing and participating in economically productive activity. What are the ways that we can, at an institutional level, for example, think about our supply chains and our value chains and their impacts on people in other countries uh, in um, what I would refer to as majority countries or developing countries. What sorts of impacts can we have through those sorts of um, activities which are, one would argue, a much more substantial part of the economic picture? And this is not just academic obfuscation, this is actually a question about what sorts of direct action can be taken through those kinds of activities. I also think we need to think differently about giving in the sense that there's clearly an appetite for giving differently emerging or already emergent, particularly through the practices of crowdfunding, for example. There seems to be an appetite amongst people, and I don't think that it's generationally specific, but an appetite for giving in ways that have real immediacy and impact. Going to the question, though, or, or the comment that, that Professor Singer made about um, the absence of evidence and the evidence of absence, um, I think that's a really significant one because part of the thinking that John's talking about with regard to strategic philanthropy is about what kind of prevention science we can engage in. How can we actually stop issues becoming issues? There's a real challenge around that when there's a whole um, uh, aspect of performativity that sits around decisions made with regard to philanthropic giving because clearly when we prevent something from happening, we don't have much evidence of the problem. Uh, so there's a bit of a conundrum there in the ways in which we can really move towards uh, a strong focus on prevention science and prevention giving um, uh, in a context where we're very focused on measuring impacts. And as the director of one of the Centre for Social Impact nodes in Australia, I'm very conscious of that conundrum. I did also want to quickly talk about the home and away binary that we um, are talking about tonight and acknowledging that this is not um, of Professor Singer's making but more to do with the way in which um, the discussion's been uh, uh, marketed uh, for this evening's activity. But I don't really think that we're talking about home and away. I think we're talking about self and other. And the experience of European Australia's uh, relationship to Indigenous people in this country I think is a very clear case in point that geographic proximity and albeit belated citizenship in a sovereign state is not necessarily um, a, a certainty uh, that we're going to be inclusive and ensure that um, all people 
uh, effectively involved in accessing collective material gains. On the flip side, we live in an era of, that um, Zygmunt Bauman's talked about as being uh, liquid modernity. And I think that that's a question that I have for you tonight, um, is how do we make decisions as ethical citizens around investing in those sorts of um, activities such as technological advancements that are taking place at home that actually have very substantial uh, implications for resolving problems in many different places. How do we make those decisions? How do we uh, work out what constitutes um, uh, ethical practice that is actually about supporting of the other, in inverted commas, rather than ethical practice that is guided by questions of home and away? I'll leave it there and thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, as Joe has already said, as I expected, um, it's obviously very difficult to argue against uh, Peter, but I'm sure Julian will do a good job of it later. Um, but if we're thinking about contrasting the wealth of uh, comparative wealth of Australia with most other countries, so I'm confident that in this room um, everybody understands the concept of alt altruism, selflessness, self unselfishness and the concern for the welfare of others. And I really like the concept of effective altruism. Um, people who donate a significant part of their life to improving the world as effectively as they can. So I want to focus on three elements of that um, description. So firstly, the world. Um, for Peter and many in the room, their focus is the world as a whole, um, and especially where poverty is endemic and extreme. But what about Australia as a country, as, as a whole, or Victoria, or a suburb, or a neighbourhood, or a local community? Aren't these worlds equally legitimate? And secondly, when we think of effectiveness, um, what measures will we use? Because effectiveness always implies there's an agreed goal. And, but people's goals are different. So if someone decides to support an orchestra because they believe, that the power, they believe in the power of music to bring people together, is this less effective? Or people who are vitally concerned about old growth forests who contribute time and resources to campaigning? And third, when we think about donating part of, part of one's life, um, money is always implied, but what about the time, energy and brain power, creativity and brain power? Which brings me to, I think, a very, a very good example about when, chari when charity does begin at home. Um, you may know that Berry Street's been around for a long time, since 1877. Um, we were founded by a group of women um, who came together because they were concerned about the high death of infants, high death rate of infants and the plight of pregnant girls and women, many without homes, money or hope. These women saw a problem and decided to do something about it. They gave their time, their energy, their money and they used their contacts uh, and networks for their cause. And today, Berry Street is a very large organisation with over a thousand staff, and we worked with 24,500 children, young people, and adults last year. So, our vision at Berry Street is that all children have a good childhood and that they grow up feeling safe, nurtured, and with hope for the future. And, uh, but we know that there are many indications that that's not happening for far too many Victorian children, especially those children who are subject to abuse and violence. If children can't stay safely at home or with relatives, then foster care is the best, next best option. And volunteer foster carers absolutely epitomise altruism as they voluntarily take traumatised children into their lives for as long as needed. But foster care in Victoria is itself at great risk. We have an ageing workforce with more people leaving than entering every year as a proportion of uh, children in out-of-home care um, foster care has declined from 37% to 21% over the last 10 years. Um, and without significant change within the next five years, foster care will probably disappear as an option in Victoria. And the results of this would be disastrous and we would never want to get back to babies' homes. But seriously, if we don't have other options for children, we may be contemplating that. So together with the Foster Care Association of Victoria, we are running a campaign to save foster care. And this is only possible because of the commitment and generosity of foster parents, our partnerships with the universities, and particularly the University of uh, New South Wales Social Policy Research Centre, philanthropic support and Berry Street donors, 
who've provided the drive and the funds to lead this work nationally, develop a professional model, cost the downstream savings, access specialist taxation advice, and help with communication and advocacy. We're not there. We're not there yet. But at Berry Street, our motto is "We never give up." So uh, we've got the state election um, coming up in November, which provides another platform um, to try and get the political commitment that we're going to need. Children don't have any say into the family into which they're born. The children we care for were dreadfully betrayed by adults who were meant to protect them. I think we can be most effective focusing on where we can achieve change, and for us, that's children in Victoria. Um, I wish Peter was right. <laughs> it would be a far better world if he was, but the argument that charity should begin at home doesn't lead to the result that charity does begin at home or that it will begin at home. Um, that's why I wish he was right. And I think that, and I, you know, I read the book, um, A Life You Can Save, with great interest, and especially it grabbed me at the start, but it lost me somewhere along the way. And I've tried to analyse why that is, um, and I tried to analyse it again listening to you tonight, Peter. And I think the difficulty is that I have a problem with utilitarian theory. Utilitarian theory is based on the philosophic calculus. And one of the alarming things about the philosophic calculus is that the result tends to vary depending on who's doing the arithmetic. And I think this is pretty much what Sandy was pointing out when she referred to the problem of how do you measure the effectiveness of any charitable act. Um, you know, what one person would regard as the highest possible, uh, most effective uh, charitable effort will not necessarily agree with someone else's choice. Now let's agree on a couple of things. First of all, it is essential that charity must begin. It must begin somewhere. It would be a tragedy if it didn't begin anywhere. Um, it is likely to start at home. That's just the way human experience shows it, and perhaps for the reasons that Peter pointed to. And I agree that it should not stay at home. But uh, I think the difficulty, and the difference between Peter's position and mine, is that in my opinion, Charity is an essentially natural human impulse. It is not the result of an intellectual calculation. And I doubt that it ever will simply be the result of an intellectual calculation. In Peter's book, uh, it begins with a very compelling uh, illustration. You're walking through a park, <clears throat> you're walking past a pond, and in the pond you see a young child clearly struggling for her life, she will clearly drown unless you help her straight away. There are no other adult, adults around to help. But you've just bought a brand new pair of very expensive shoes and they'll be ruined if you run into the pond and help the child. Well, of course, everyone naturally would prefer to ruin the shoes in order to save the child rather than save the shoes and let the child drown, of course. Um, but then Peter develops that argument to the point which you understood tonight, that you should in fact look at the effectiveness of what you're going to do and maybe you shouldn't have bought the $500 shoes, maybe instead you should have sent the $500 overseas because you've got a perfectly good pair of shoes in the cupboard in any event. Incidentally, it's something that I think all women should take <laughs> account of. <clears throat> but. Let us suppose a variant to that very compelling illustration. Let's suppose that you read, just before you set out for your walk in the park, you read that there is a really vigorous secondary market for this sort of shoe that you've just bought, uh, because they're no longer available, and you can in fact sell them for $1,000. Now, maybe on one argument you could say, OK, look, I won't wreck the shoes, what I'll do is I'll rush off and I'll sell the shoes for $1,000 and I'll send the $1,000 overseas and I'll be able to save a dozen children. And saving a dozen children better than saving one. But that would be grotesquely inhuman. No one is going to do that. And yet, a philosophic calculation would lead you to that result. Last night, um, and this is what set my mind thinking in this direction, last night I was walking through the city. It was very cold. It was raining a bit. And there was a bloke sitting out on a, on a seat in Queen Street. 
and he was trying to engage passers-by, but no one was really paying much attention. Uh, he was just saying, oh, excuse me, excuse me, and I, and I stopped. And he said, have you got any change? Well, I didn't have any change, but I had a $5 note in my pocket, and I gave it to him and chatted to him for a moment and then went on. Now, I suppose I could have been more effectively charitable by sending that $5 to an overseas charity. But it wouldn't have occurred to me to do that because there is something more immediate about the possibility of doing something here and now um, which is immediately engaging and compelling uh, and there is not the same sort of compulsion to make the same charitable effort in a different direction even if your mind tells you that that might be a more effective way of doing things. Um, I was interested in the slide about the trachoma victims. Uh, it was characteristic of slides of that sort. I don't for an instant uh, decry that sort of charity. I think it would be a marvellous thing if everyone gave money to help reduce uh, or avoid trachoma in third world countries. But it's interesting that the photograph that is used to capture you is a photograph of nice looking kids because that's what gets people's attention. You could have a page of text which explains uh, the evils of trachoma and the economics of helping it, but it will not be as compelling as seeing photographs of children because the human impulse is engaged by the sight of a child whom you can help. And everyone who donates money to charities of that sort believes at some level of consciousness that they're helping that child. Not, not some nasty looking flea bitten kid, but that child who is so engaging. Uh, and all of this, I think, sorry to put it crudely, but you understand the point. Um, I, I think the point about all of this is, of course, it's the ethics of proximity running up against uh, consequentialism. And for my money, the ethics of proximity usually carries the day, will always carry the day, in my opinion. And for that reason, our charitable endeavours might be less effective overall than they would otherwise be, although that's not altogether clear because the reality is that if everyone responds according to what captures them, what is uh, you know, following their heart, following their passion, maybe stopping short at the, uh, uh, the Stroganoff Madonna, but um, stopping short of that, most people will give in a way which is effective according to their view of the world and with enough people giving and in a country like this, everyone should be giving, with enough people giving, then it seems to me that all of the appropriate charities will, in fact, uh, end up being funded. It would be a grotesque result if everyone in the country decided, I'm going to send all my money to the Tr Trachoma Foundation, because then all of the other charities would starve and Berry Street would be on the street and, <laughs> and there'd be no more trachoma in Africa. You know, good result, but also a bad result. Um, the ethics of proximity is something which has engaged me for a while because in the area in which people know a bit about what I do, the asylum seekers area, um, a lot of people argue, well, look, um, if, what, what, what about all those people in African camps? Uh, OK, well, there's an interesting test, and, and here perhaps um, recent experience runs against me, but imagine uh, a refugee in an African camp and imagine the... They have every, every qualification that would entitle them to asylum. And imagine a person with absolutely identical qualifications for asylum and they wash up at your feet on Australian soil. Will you turn that one away in order to help the one on the other side of the world? Now, I, when I say it washes up at your feet, I'm not saying you hear about them or read about them or ha have the politicians tell you about them but they actually are at your feet. You individually find an asylum seeker at your feet and you have the option of either saying, no, you go back, you go and join a mythical queue because I'm going to bring someone from the other side of the world in your place. I doubt that there's anyone who would actually make that choice. Only politicians make choices like that. <laughs> but amongst human beings like us, I think no one is going to make that choice. Um, it, it seems to me that charity which follows the donor's passions 
is also likely to be more generously calculated. Um, a person who would otherwise have put $5 million towards the Stroganoff Madonna, I suspect would not give $5 million towards trachoma. They might give maybe half a million dollars towards trachoma. Um, and that's a very important point. If, if your charity is guided by your passions, you are likely to give to the maximum of your potential rather than um, making a, a, a tighter calculation. And the reason for that is that it seems to me that charity is ultimately a human instinct and it will be guided by human passions and not by economic rationalism. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Julian Sandinger. We now have an opportunity for everyone here present to ask questions. Um, I'll just let you in on a secret. I don't decide who gets to ask a question. It's, it sort of follows the microphone. Bear with us, please. I'm Michael Liffman from Swinburne University. I think the questions to be raised very interestingly the way Julian did about the consequentialist paradigm. But the question I want to put to Peter, and he's, we've had this discussion before, so he's had notice of this, is to slightly change the, the, the pond example, in a somewhat contrived story, but imagine, if you will, that the person walking beside the pond has in their backpack, they're a curator or something, with them, they have the Stroganoff Madonna in their backpack. <laughs> if they go into the pool, the Stroganoff, the Stroganoff Madonna, $45 million will be destroyed. Does that change the, the problem? <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, uh, well, it's, of course it does change the problem in various ways. It, it's an extension of um, Julian's example of uh, you could get $1,000 for selling the shoes and let's assume you could save two lives for that and you've just upped the ante to now, well, you've got this painting in your backpack and you could sell it for $45 million and you could do a lot more. So. You know, Julian said you can't really imagine it would be inhuman to uh, leave the child drowning in the pond while you say, I'm, tomorrow I'm going to sell my shoes and donate the $1,000. And that's, of course, very similar to his case of the asylum seeker who washes up at your feet. Um, and I'm inclined to agree that charity is to a significant extent based on charitable impulses, altruistic impulses, which we have. So I, d I don't disagree with, with Julian entirely about that. Um, so it may well be that if I were in the situation he described, or perhaps even in the situation you described, I would save the child in both cases, even though I would know in some way that I could be doing more good um, if I didn't. But I don't think that answers the question of what ought I to be doing. I mean, if you're, if you're prepared to have sufficiently contrived situations, you could no doubt f imagine situations in which you have to torture somebody, perhaps even an in innocent person. You have to torture them in order to stop a nuclear bomb going off that'll kill hundreds of thousands of people and sicken um, millions more. Um, I'm not sure whether I could torture, you know, make it a child if you like. I'm not sure that I could torture a child. It's Dostoevsky's question where he point in the brothers Karamazov, he points to this child over there and say, you know, to create more or less utopia, you have to torture that child to death. Maybe I couldn't, but maybe nevertheless, it would be the right thing to do if somehow, fantastically, that really was going to achieve those results. So at least in your case, less sure about Julian's case, at least in your case, if I could sell the $45 million painting, um, maybe the right thing to do would be to let the child drown, difficult as it was. Um, so if, if that's what you're asking about, um, that's how I would answer it. If you're saying, no, you're not going to sell it, it's just going to go back on display in the museum, um, well, this is then a test of you know, whether I'm really a bit of a philistine about art, and um, <laughs> that's, that's why I don't care that much. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think I would probably save the child at the cost of the painting. I think, uh, you know, one of the things that, that strikes me about museums putting paintings on like this, and it's a bit off the track, especially when you see it behind that bulletproof glass, is, you know, are you really getting a look at anything better than you could see if you go online with a really good screen um, and you look at the picture there? Um, or for that matter, if you buy an expensive art book and look at a reproduction? I'm not sure exactly what it is that um, means we have to have the original there in front of us. 
Um, I'd like to invite the panel to consider the question slightly differently. Sorry. Please oh, sorry. introduce yourself. Joe Kavanagh, CEO of Family Life in um, Melbourne, a uh, community service organisation. Um, for me, the real problem is actually about not which charity or to be charitable, but to motivate more giving. So would it be better to address rather than charity here or charity there, is charity worthwhile and embark on the crusade to prove the effectiveness of charity everywhere? So is charity worthwhile is my question. Um, I, I noticed uh, Bruce Bonahardi somewhere in the audience. Um, if, if you just think about all the things that have been achieved through uh, good people working together, dedicating their time and resources, and the NDIS is the you know the most recent and very well known example, of course. Oh, you're not going to give me the rider, are you? <laughs> Um, plainly, charity is worthwhile. Apart from anything else, I do think it's a natural human impulse and, um, and it's probably one of the few natural human impulses that is really worthwhile. Um, how do we encourage more? <laughs> one of the few. I'm keeping the options open, all right? <laughs> um, how do we encourage people more? To be candid, I think, and Peter would disagree with this, but I think you appeal to people's passions. You know, you, 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 you appeal to their passions, show them that the, the sense of doing good which they will get by doing something in which they passionately believe is worth doing and that they can do it. Um, the pr practical implementation of that is going to vary enormously according to circumstances, but that's the way to do it in theory. Is it worthwhile? Absolutely. Um, I do think, though, that one of the things that concerns me about notions of charity is, again, a binary about giving and taking. And I think that actually we need to recast the thinking about it because, as Julian's just said, there's reciprocity, there's both give and take in giving. Um, and that's what concerns me is the... from Because my area of work and passion is very much around the social economy, what concerns me is when constructions of charity construct the subjects of charity as passive takers or receivers. And that is not a true um, analysis of the reality. And it, in my view, it's also one that can be quite damaging. So I feel that in a way we need to critically question our charitable intents um, and to, to recast that idea of giving and taking. Thanks. Um, yeah, I want to agree with things that the panel have been saying just now. Um, and sort of specifically with what Joe was saying, what, one thing that I didn't have time to go into in my talk is that I do think um, taking part in charity and in effective altruism actually benefits the people doing it. So much so that some people say, well, should you really be calling it altruism? Because I think it, for many people, and I know many people in the movement, they feel um, this has greatly enriched my life. You know, I should have been doing this long ago, some people say, who've come to it somewhat late. Um, my life is much more rewarding and fulfilling. And what am I giving up after all? Well, you know, I'm giving up some level of material well-being, um, but which doesn't really make much difference to my happiness because there's lots of studies that show that once you get to a certain plateau, um, additional income makes, if anything, a very, very marginal difference to your, to your well-being, whereas having a sense of meaning and fulfilment makes a big difference. So I, I totally agree with what Joe is saying there. Um, and also on the other question, I, I do want to make another point that really what I was talking about was the priorities that we ought to have, as I see it, in this situation. Um, but I think charity, when it is focused locally, is also worthwhile in itself. It's only that I think, unfortunately, we don't have those kind of bank accounts where you can write um, a big check to um, a charity that's helping the global poor and just as big a check to a charity that's helping locally um, uh, and you know somehow you've got just as much money as if you'd given uh, similar both amounts to to the overseas one it doesn't work that way it is a trade-off unfortunately um, with the resources we have so you know what I'm really talking about I suppose is dealing with the worst the most urgent cases the low-hanging fruit that's out there and I certainly think that um, we ought to be you know if we could deal with those things we ought to be helping the poor in Australia and you know even then if we can deal with that to some extent 
donating to museums to buy works of art. I mean, that's in itself worthwhile. It's just that it has to compete with all of these other priorities as I see it. And I see the situation as saying that there are greater priorities out there. Um, perhaps this is the chance to respond to one thing that Julian said, where he said, if everyone in Australia were to give to the trachoma uh, prevention organization, uh, then everybody in Africa would not have a problem with trachoma, but things would be terrible here. Um, you know, really what I'm asking for is a redirection, and I recognize that it's not likely to happen, that people will stop giving to uh, Family Life or to Berry Street or other things. There is going to be some money for that. I'm, I'm looking for some redirection that I think we can, because although, as Julian said, there are various impulses here, there are also rational reflection that affects it to some extent. Um, and you know, if we could deal with trachoma in Africa, then that would be great. And then certainly if we dealt with that and some of the other problems in developing countries, we would be coming back here to focus on those things that certainly need doing here. A question at the back. My name is Rosales, and I work for Fitzroy Learning Network. Um, I hope after my question, everyone is keen to hand it in me a check, okay? <laughs> Although what I am going to say might compromise um, that, that process. Um, I actually think that we are norm normalizing the notion that charity is a good thing. I like to question the notion of charity simply because I think we, um, we have charity because there is inequality we have a major problem with distribution around the world, and also we have a major problem of no questioning greediness. And I think also that there is a major issue thinking that one thing has more value than others. Peter, I wish you could have set up an example um, for a sport rather than arts, because the arts are suffering as we can experience, there are a lot of artists on the streets, homeless. Um, and I just wish we can stop normalizing the fact that poverty exists. I think the question perhaps should be um, readdressed. The question is not whether one thing is more ethical than another, given to one, um, uh, you know, uh, group or, or yeah, one group or one um, social um, thing that you think it has more value than others. I think that the question should be how can we become perhaps better humans and be able to distribute what we work and produce and what other generations have worked very hard to um, produce around the world um, rather than, you know, utilizing a Christian language to think that is more valuable than other actions. Well, let me just say one thing, um, perhaps. I, 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 in a way, I agree with you about the term charity. I've various points written that charity does suggest, to me, I, I don't like the term because it suggests something that's optional, whereas I've argued that it's an essential part of living ethically, is to help those who are much worse off than you, where you can make a big improvement in their life at a small cost to your own life. So I think it would be great if we could get rid of the term charity, but I use it because people do understand quickly what you mean without that kind of explanation. Um, it would certainly be better if we had a world in which there was no need for charity because everybody was looked after by, um, a state, for example, that redistributed well and people accepted that if they had plenty that the state was entitled to take some of what they had and, and use it to help others. Um, but you know, we're a long way from that kind of world and uh, we don't really seem to be getting closer to it at the moment. Rather, um, you know, those, those differences are increasing. So while some people sometimes say, well, I, I should be arguing instead for some kind of revolutionary change to the global economic order, um, I'd be really happy if that were to happen, but I just don't see any prospect of it happening in the near future, and I don't uh, feel that I would have much to really recommend in ways of achieving that. 
So that's why I think, as I say, in the situation in which we are, um, I do think that it's, it is, a, and here I disagree with you, I guess, that it is an important part of living ethically to think about what we can do for those who are much worse off than we are. We have one last question. Bruce Bonnie Hattie. I'd just like to ask the panel um, to comment on uh, the use of the word charity. It seems to me in what Peter has talked about that he's really talking about the gift of money. So if the question were, does the philanthropy begin at home, where philanthropy includes not just money, but time and voice and influence, uh, does it begin at home or does it begin abroad? Because I think in the story that um, Sandy told about the origins of Berry Street, we have the story of women who had great effectiveness in their voice and influence at home. And of course, in Julian's work uh, with asylum seekers, um, he's effective at home. And so I just would like the panel to um, discuss the, the, this point about what does charity mean? Is it more than money? I just thought, Bruce, that I'd start um, in the response with some reflections on some research that I did last year, which was on the response of volunteers to the 2009-2010 floods in Queensland. And volunteering in Queensland was absolutely inundated by more than 30,000 people from mostly uh, Queensland, but also internationally, who uh, were trying to give in you know, philanthropic ways that didn't involve money. And when we did the study, um, there was a couple of interesting things that came out of it for me. One was that, um, well, three actually. One was that people, um, the, the, the dominant um, reason for people giving was that they were asked. Uh, and that was being asked by the then Premier of Queensland, the Lord Mayor, then Lord Mayor of Queensland, through to immediate family and friends. The second bit of it that was interesting was that within the first 48 hours after the floods, the primary source of asking and connecting volunteers to activity on the ground was family and friends. Civil society organisations played no role. Frankly, the technology had shut down in um, South East Queensland and they couldn't get their voices heard. And it wasn't until a few days later that civil society organisations came in and played a role. And what that spells out for me is the significance of civil society in the sense of the infrastructure of relationships between people in community that really mattered in terms of enabling that giving. And the third thing that I'd say about it that I thought was really interesting was that one of the things that came out in the study was that an offer to help in that context was a cry for help for many, many people. There was a therapeutic effect to giving and that hasn't been recognised in our conceptions of public health and health promotion, but one of the primary reasons why people offer to help in response to a natural disaster is because they feel personally affected by it and they want to be part of their own therapeutic process. I, I would resist the idea that charity has been degraded as a, a word, although I can understand the argument. Philanthropy has other overtones, which I think are also a disadvantage. But I think your question does raise the interesting point about um, <coughs> attitudes to charitable work generally. And certainly I think charity should be understood as more than merely giving money. But unfortunately, in Australia over the last mm, 40 or 50 years, We've shifted so that a great deal of social support is actually done by government or with government funds. And the sort of volunteerism that you found as a, a, an inbuilt part of the community in Australia 50 years ago is much less prominent now. And I think that's partly because people think, well, you know, I'm paying my taxes and so there's really no, there's no need. Uh, whereas, of course, there always is a need, and when you get something like the Queensland floods, people can see the need, they can understand it, and they respond as you would wish they would respond. Um, but I think there's another trend which is going on in very recent times, which is deeply regrettable, and that is the idea that, the, that our society is made up of leaners and lifters. That's one of the most toxic ideas imaginable uh, when the question is what sort of charitable response will you get from the community. And I must say, I hope that the idea of dividing the community into leaners and lifters does not take on. 
and I sort of um, rather hope quietly that we may be able to edge back towards the way things were in the 1950s when uh, charitable contributions of all sorts, not just money, was part of what you thought was your social obligation, uh, a, a privilege to be able to do rather than an obligation which you'd duck if you could. Well, thanks, Bruce. I, I think it's, a, it's an important question. And I certainly do think that there's a place for volunteering and giving time in various ways. And it involves people in the activity and they get to learn often more about it. But um, I also think, and this is perhaps where, you know, it's clear in Julian's discussion and that we have somewhat different emphases. I also think that when you think about being maximally effective, you may sometimes be doing things which are somewhat contrary to the impulses you have. So for example, for someone in, in Julian's position to say, look, um, I want to go and volunteer, and let's say, uh, therefore, I'm going to go over to a developing country and I'm going to help people to build houses. Well, I take it that Julian's expertise is not in carpentry or knocking in nails. He may be very good at that, I don't know, but, but he's certainly got particular expertise um, as a barrister, and we know that senior barristers are fairly well rewarded financially. For, so for him to take a month off, not earn the money he could be earning, um, is not re doesn't really make sense. He'd be, d be doing much better to donate that so that um, people who, are, who have those skills, of whom there are plenty already in Africa, can be employed in constructing the housing. Um, and that is going to have a better outcome. So I think it really will depend on us as individuals uh, what the balance of skills and time and resources um, a as against money is going to be. And Although giving money does sort of seem in a way rather colder than, than giving your time, I think we just have to face it that for some people that's still going to be um, a better thing for them to do. Thank you, Peter. Please join me in thanking our panel. <laughs>Tonight we've had just a taste of some of the complexities around giving more, giving more effectively and giving more ethically. And there'll be more opportunities to think, reflect and act on these kinds of conversations later in the year and years going forward. Um, we'll be convening another couple of similar events uh, later this year. The, our next one in fact involves a visit and presentation by the President of the Foundation Centre in the United States, Brad Smith. The Foundation Centre is a core piece of soft infrastructure for sharing information that enables effective and ethical giving. We lack anything like that in this country. And so we hope to be able to generate a conversation around building infrastructure in this country to enable people to make better, more informed, more ethical and more effective choices in their giving. And of course the whole question of giving, as was raised, is, is, is itself a matter of some controversy and one we should not shy away from because the most effective giving is that which affects real social change with the assistance of government, with the assistance of communities, with the assistance of families at home and abroad. So, um, oh, I must then not only thank Peter, but offer a small contribution towards his work, um, uh, a donation by the university um, towards the uh, organisation that Peter's founded in order to promote this work. And you're most welcome to come up and chase up further information about that. And um, with that, I'd like to formally close the evening's proceedings. Thank you very, very much for coming out on this program.